So uh, welcome everyone. I'm told that the room is full enough that we can start. So we're not going to start on MIT time. We'll start on Paris time where everything is extremely punctual. <laughs> So Francis is coming to us, uh, Francis Pack is coming to us from Paris uh, at Inrea, where he leads the CR team. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor uh, at the uh, Normale Supérieure in the DDI, the Department d'Informatique. Uh, Francis got his PhD from UC Berkeley with uh, Michael Jordan uh, on uh, machine learning for blind source separation. Uh, and uh, starting from there, he's starting to have very impactful uh, um, Publications uh, and contributions. So he's uh, actually a Thompson Reuters highly cited researcher for work on uh, safeguarding from kernel methods, um, kernel LCA, and then uh, multiple kernel learning, where, uh, which was awarded uh, the 10 year best paper award at ICML in 2014. And more recently, uh, he's moved uh, uh, from kernels onto uh, structured uh, estimation, so uh, with influential contributions to structured uh, sparsity. Uh, with applications to vision, notably, and also to uh, sparse matrix, uh, structure matrix factorization, uh, such as sparse coding and dictionary learning. Uh, so um, he also has uh, uh, now is uh, I think spending quite a bit of time on optimization for machine learning. He has a very influential monograph that I highly recommend on uh, some modular optimization for machine learning. Uh, but I think. Uh, 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 Probably his most influential contributions are uh, first order optimization uh, with SAG and SAGA and probably a long list of other acronyms. Uh, so uh, we have common friends, so I asked for a uh, particular um, anecdote to tell about Francis. And uh, the juiciest one I got is that Francis climbed Mont Ventoux every year uh, with his bike, so he's a uh, avid and strong cyclist. Uh, but uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, give the floor to Francis. He's oh. me, welcome. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much, Philippe, for the very uh, nice introduction and for inviting me uh, here. So uh, today I'm going to talk, it's, it's not going to be super technical, but there will be some, some math. And the uh, key question that you all uh, hear uh, to listen, the answer to is, can uh, ML survive the AI revolution? So let me, let me start by giving you some, some context. And this is like a slide I've been using in the last uh, 10 years uh, or so. So there is a lot of data and in the personal life, in industry, and even beyond the Google, Amazon, Facebook, in many, many sciences. Okay, this is very, very common, uh, I guess, in this room to say something like this. And the goal is there's a need for like aut automated ways to learn from that da data. And so depending on the year I would give that talk, I will have a series of hypes, okay? So there was big data maybe 10 years ago, then there was data science, now there's also machine learning, deep learning, uh, AI. So for me, this has not changed the way I do research, but I'm, the marketing has changed a bit. And uh, uh, in, terms, in terms of hype, let's go straight to the point. So let's measure the hype. So the hype we can be measured okay, from like Google Trends. So if you have some time uh, to, uh, to lose, so you can uh, spend some time in Google Trends. So you can ask the number of search, search queries that you see uh, on Google, like, and you can compare like three terms, ma machine learning, AI, and big data, and uh, over time. As you can see, big data was big in the year like <coughs> two, uh, 2014, it's going down, and AI and uh, machine learning is going up. And uh, don't remember, please remember that there is this decay from like uh, uh, 10 years ago, which were the remaining of the last uh, AI winter. So beyond hype, there is progress, okay? So, and, and let me give you two examples of the strong progress. This comes mostly from uh, perception, say computer vision, NLP, and, and similar fields. So here, uh, this is like examples from Google Translate, which is like uh, kind of amazing uh, for automatic translation. And this is example from, on the right, uh, from, uh, oops, sorry, from a colleague at Inoria. So you can label images in a very, uh, in a very nice way even uh, with actions and actions which could be like uh, not, not, really, uh, not really common. So for all of that, this is like also well known that all of this was made uh, through like a combination of factors. So massive data uh, to learn from, to do machine learning, computing power quite a bit, and also some of course progress from like both machine learning and those like uh, uh, fields like computer vision and uh, NLP. So uh, in terms of AI, okay, so it's not a talk about what I think intelligence is, but I put this in quote, because at the end this is just like, to me, like glorified uh, uh, pattern matching with uh, some algorithms trying to reproduce what you've seen in the training data, 
plus power, uh, computing power, and also, so, of course, a lot of models, okay? So by no means, I want to say that uh, AI progress is only done by machine learning. This is done by machine learning in combination with uh, computer vision and NLP uh, and uh, other things. Okay, so for me, I'm doing machine learning, so I don't care so much about AI. So for me, machine learning is a field which I entered uh, like uh, 20 years ago almost. There are some conferences, NIPS, ICML, calls, some journal. And what I really like uh, about the field, and let me make one comment, it's not AI. Okay, I guess you all know it uh, here, but it's really not, uh, uh, among us, we don't call it AI. Okay, we call it AI when you go, uh, uh, go talk to journalists or funding agencies. So what I really like about that field, and the reason why I, I'm really enjoying uh, 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 research here, is that the, the diversity of contributions. So if you go to NIPS or ICML, you have like people doing very like practical things and people doing very theoretical things. And this has been the case for the last uh, uh, 20 years and probably before as well, but I was not there yet. And, and this, is, this is what I mean is a bit not in danger, but to me, when I say can AI survive, is can, uh, can ML survive? I mean this, this type of ML, where there's a constant exchanges between theory and practice. So a bit what has changed in the last 20 years, so growth, okay, so this is those are numbers for, for NIPS. So like, uh, like uh, more than five times the number of papers and more like close to like 20 times the number of, uh, of people, okay? You see more industry, okay? So this is like, can be seen in uh, both as contributors, so they, like published papers at NIPS, but also they come to NIPS or ICML as a way to uh, get IDs and uh, uh, as students. So I'm not giving, going to give a talk on the sociology of, of machine learning and whether we're all going to end up in, in, in industry or not. My goal is really, can we uh, still uh, sustain this nice uh, uh, interplay between theory uh, and practice? And I will uh, choose like two, uh, two areas, one for which I think this has been quite successful. So this is, uh, a work on like uh, stochastic gradients. So I will present mostly like our work, but also other people's work, showing that this come as a very nice uh, a set of algorithms that will have a good interplay between what you see in practice and what you see in theory. And then this will be the first part of the talk. And then I will, of course, deal with like the most uh, like things which are not as, as simple, where the match is not as clear, which is like deep learning. And I will present like some much weaker type of results uh, uh, trying to do something about that area. And at last slide, I will answer the question with a yes or no. All right, so this is like uh, the technical part of the talk. So I'm going to consider some like a data X, I, Y, I. You can think of X, I as being an image, or Y, I being, uh, being labeled on the image, or X, I as being uh, uh, a person in, in his past uh, web history, okay? And Y, I, whether they're going to click on an ad or not. And the goal is to predict y uh, uh, given x, and this is being done by a, some predictor function h that depends on x by input and some parameter theta in rd. So classical examples, you have linear predictions. Okay, so this is for the web example. Uh, this is uh, commonly used. You take your, base, your big uh, sparse vector of uh, like a one or zero, one if you went to website or not, or zero otherwise, and it's going to predict if you're going to see a given, or to click on a given ad or not. So this is like, still like money making in the year uh, 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 right now. But if you do like uh, computer vision or NLP, you're more used to like nonlinear models where you essentially parameterize your feature vector phi of x as a sequence of nonlinear operations. And in the first part of the talk, I will mostly focus on what's simple, okay, the linear predictions because I'm going to require uh, convexity. So the way I'm going to do the learning is very classical. I'm going to minimize some regularized empirical risk where I have an error on my data, okay, with a certain loss function between my outputs and my predictions and some regularizer. And if you want to make things concrete for the tool, you can think of uh, the uh, loss as being the square loss. This can be logistics or any, any uh, convex loss, okay? So there are typically like, uh, so the way I'm going, uh, uh, the structure I'm going to use uh, to see this as a special optimization problem is it's a finite sum or a finite average over my training day. So in that setup, very classically, you have a pure optimization problem where you want to find the optimizer of this uh, empirical risk. This is the main focus of, uh, of this talk. And you also have, of course, the statistical question is, I want to make sure I do well on unseen data. Okay, this is very like machine learning 101. I'm going to focus uh, uh, on that. 
So since I'm going to focus on that, on that, I need to make some assumptions. So remember, this is like the theoretical, like guaranteed part of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the talk. So I need to make some assumptions. And hopefully, with those assumptions, I'm going to quantify how much time I need to get a solution of that. So assumptions are quite classical in optimization. This would be like smoothness and, uh, and complexity. So here, I'm simplifying a bit. So I'm going to assume smoothness through like the boundedness of my, uh, of my uh, uh, Hessians, okay? So on the left, a smooth function. On the right, a non-smooth function because you have a kink. And I consider this as being like a weak uh, assumption because in machine learning, if you assume like a smooth loss, which I'm going to assume, and if you assume edge is a smooth function, this is typically uh, uh, smooth, okay? So this is a weak uh, sort of, of assumption, much weaker than what people typically use, uh, uh, which is, lower bounds on the eigenvalues of the Hessians. So this is like convexity, if you just uh, assume uh, uh, zero lower bounds, on the left, a convex function. And also, you may assume that even more than convexity, something like strong convexity, which is typically obtained by putting, adding a convex regularizer on top of your convex function. So now this is a strong assumption, okay? This is very well known. And before I discuss the strong assumption, then uh, this is like the classical like optimization uh, uh, picture where uh, the condition number appears, which is a ratio, so I'm sorry about the low quality of the projector. Uh, uh, well, it's not my fault, but... Uh, <laughs> and its uh, condition number is uh, the ratio of the second values, so uh, L over mu is always bigger than one. So if you have a large condition number, it's going to be uh, hard to optimize. We should think of this, so in 2D. And if you have a small condition number, this is going to be uh, 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 easy. So in, in a sense, so if you run gradient descent, you do a lot of oscillations uh, if you have a large condition number, and only a few uh, oscillations if you have a small condition number. So why is this like a very strong assumption? Because uh, in machine learning, this uh, sufficient condition, at least the only one I know of, is to assume uh, linear predictors, okay? So I'm going to restrict for this next 20 minutes to uh, linear predictions. So this is like very, this will not include neural networks. And typically you add strong convexity by adding some regularizer, okay? Which you would anyway to avoid overfitting. And trust me, typically uh, the condition number is of the order of N. Okay, there are many reasons uh, uh, for that. But when I, th when I, the problem that we need to solve in machine learning, even the convex ones, uh, tend to have a condition number that goes up with a number of examples. So when n is 10 to the ninth, this is like a very ill condition problem. All right, so why uh, convexity? Okay, so here, uh, for two reasons, because we can prove bounds, okay, this is the main uh, uh, goal uh, here, but also because uh, uh, to define algorithms, you don't need convexity. If you take SGD, which I will present in the, in the slide, you don't, need to, you don't need convexity to define it. You need convexity to, uh, to uh, study it, Okay, but you don't need convexity. And more, most of the things I'm going to say uh, for convex problems should extend more or less to uh, non-convexity if you replace a uh, global optimum by a stationary point. Okay, this is a very like, loose statement, but uh, 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 so I'm going to make things simple here and assume that uh, I have convexity. All right, so what is known for those problems? So we have a finite sum and there are classical algorithms for this. The first one is a batch gradient descent, so it's iterative. You go from step t minus one to t by going down the direction of the negative gradient. So I guess, yeah, so this is equal, and this is minus, okay? Sorry about that. Again, not my fault. Um, so you get a negative, neg negative uh, gradient uh, 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 like this. And the key issue is that computing the full gradient of the function g, the finite sum, you have to access the entire set of functions. So it's very well known that every iteration cost is linear in n, okay, n being the number of functions, or here the number of data points. And, but the good thing is that you get this nice exponential convergence. At the other side of the spectrum, okay, you have, so you make a few big iterations. At the uh, other side of the spectrum, you have SGD, where you replace taking the overall, the whole sum, by just taking a single element taken uh, uh, uniformly at random, so typically with uh, replacement for analysis. And by design, this is like independent of n uh, as an algorithm, okay? Every iteration is O of D, but you lose this exponential dependence in time to a dependence which is uh, kappa uh, uh, over uh, T, so you go from to one over T. So the image you should have, First, it's not a descent technique. It may go up, so the name is very ill-chosen. This is the way it is. And you make oscillations, okay? And at the end, you end up converging uh, to this. All right, so in a 
wishful thinking manner, and I think this is the key here, is that uh, if you want to do theory, I always start with my student to say, this is what I want to get, and hopefully uh, uh, data will follow that, uh, that, uh, that thing as well. So this is like a wishful thinking, time in the x-axis, distance to optimum in the y-axis in the logarithmic scale, and if you take a line in this semi-log plot, this corresponds to exponential convergence, and uh, this is what you see for the batch gradient, and you have this like uh, staircase effect because, because this is a batch technique, before you make any uh, single move, you have to read the data, so you do nothing for a while, then you make a big move, do nothing for a while, make a big move. Okay, so this is deterministic. Whereas for stochastic, you start by um, like making progress as soon as you see uh, the first observation. Okay, it goes very quickly, and then you, you hit this fall over T convergence rate, so it, it just uh, levels off. So the goal of the techniques that I'm going to present is trying to get the best of both worlds. You start uh, fast, and you end up uh, with, uh, with a line, so lin lin linear convergence. And as a, benefit, as a benefit, the slope will, will even be a bit, a bit steeper. Okay, so let's look at this. So, uh, so I'm not going to, to cover all the related work uh, related to this. You see, I want to go uh, directly to the results because I want to draw some conclusions. So the algorithm uh, that, that we started with in 2012 was in collaboration with Nicolas Leroux and, uh, and Mark Schmidt. We call like stochastic average gradient, which is a very simple modification of SGD. So you, you still like at every step compute a gradient, but now you're going to store it. So I'm going so iteratively, I'm going to select a function i of t at random, compute a gradient, and store it. So here in that slide, the y i t is a version of a gradient i that I, that I have uh, in my uh, uh, store at time t. So when I recompute, uh, when i is i of t, so I have selected that function, so I'm going to replace my old gradient value by the new gradient value, and for all the others, I keep uh, the same one. So this means that at every time in the algorithm, I have very young gradients and very old gradients, okay? And I can, since I have a copy, like more or less old of all gradients, I can take the average, okay? And then I can, I can make a step. So in a way, this is a very lazy way of doing gradient descent. I just recompute a single gradient and keep old ones for the other gradients I have not recomputed. And uh, the hope is to get uh, away with it. Okay, so in the picture, so this is my, my functions, my gradients, and every time I access like a single gradient, function at random, I compute the gradient, okay, update the average, make a step, then I can take another function at random, maybe the first one, recompute the gradient, change my like a yit that I have in, in, uh, in my, in my uh, memory, and then update the average, make a step. Okay, so this is a very like two-line algorithm. So first, this is not new in the sense that we really copied uh, what was done by Blatt et al. with a minor change, which turns out to be uh, significant of replace, they, what, what they were using is cycling. Okay, so you first take function one, do this, function two, do that, function three, do that, and they were iterating as cycles. So the only, the only change is uh, to make some uh, uh, random selection. And as it turns out, this allows to get like much bigger step sizes and hence get be much, uh, much, uh, much faster. All right, so you may think there's a memory requirement. I have to store gradients, so it's not a talk uh, really about this, but if you have linear models, it's not really an issue because uh, since if my functions depend on, on a linear uh, projection, then the gradients are proportional to my feature vector, so I'm not going to store uh, constant time times the feature vector, vector I'm going only to uh, uh, store the, uh, the, uh, the real number. So for linear models, this is like O of n memory. There are now extensions, not by us, but still very interesting, uh, avoiding those, like, those uh, storage issues, which I will mention later. All right, so this is like a simple algorithm. So now the goal, okay, of this part of the talk is to show that in some setups, you can have both good performance and good theory. So let's look first at the good theory. So if you're willing to make some assumptions, which I've uh, mentioned already, in terms of smoothness of my, each of the functions fi and strong convexity, then I have the condition number kappa, and uh, essentially the complexity to reach some uh, precision epsilon will depend on epsilon, of course, and on the dimension of your, uh, of your inputs, essentially the time it takes to compute the gradient of a single function fi. And I've, I've, I've shown SGD, so no, de no dependence on n, but a dependence in one over epsilon, so I don't have uh, exponential convergence. If I do a gradient descent, then I do have this log of one over epsilon, just uh, hinting at linear convergence, 
but uh, uh, I get a dependence on n, n times condition number. And remember that condition number in practice is of order n. Okay, so this is of order n squared. There is gradient acceleration, which I don't want to uh, talk uh, about now, that will improve, okay, from condition number to square root condition number, the dependence on n is still quite big. So what SAG is uh, probably achieving is replacing the product of n and kappa with the sum of n and kappa. And since kappa is typically of order n, you get an improvement up to order n. Okay, so this is like the core uh, analysis uh, uh, that we had like uh, uh, five years ago. So this, okay, beats, uh, okay, in quotes, like lower bounds in the sense that it does better than uh, 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 potential lower bounds. Of course, if we do better, there has to be some new assumptions that we, that we make. So we do better than SGD because we, we allow, uh, we uh, restrict ourselves to a finite sum structure, whereas uh, SGD can be implemented in, uh, with uh, expectations of uh, infinite sets. And we improve in some setups over like uh, Nesterov acceleration because we uh, can leverage this finite sum structure. Okay, so this is from the like theory side, it's uh, everything is uh, quantified and there's a big O's are essentially like a constant, like uh, 10 or 20. All right, so and from the practical side, so there is like all the classical tricks you can, you can use. And here, uh, uh, I want to focus on a single one, which is this one. Okay, so this one is very important in practice. So when you have functions which may vary at different rates, you may be better off uh, 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 selecting some functions more than others. Okay, this is somewhat obvious, but to me, I see this an example, a very simple example where theory can predict better performance. Okay, from the theory, if you, if you look at the bounds, there is an optimal way, like a semi-optimal way to define those probabilities. They come from analysis and uh, maybe if we're lucky, that, uh, uh, that way of selecting functions to just minimize the variance of our estimates, which is a purely theoretical uh, enterprise, can be seen in practice. As I will show in a moment, this is like pure theory and this translates into a good improvement. Now let's look at the, at the practice. So I'm, I'm taking just classical benchmarks that we have used like a, a few years ago. So, uh, so those are the classical techniques. So in, uh, in, uh, in uh, brown, this is the accelerated gradient. So it's supposed to be a, a line in this semi-log plot. So this is like number of passes of the data, okay, over la distance to optimum in logarithmic uh, scale. So a, sort of a line is like linear convergence, whereas the green curve, like the green, the, this green one is SGD. So it goes fast and then it, it just levels off. This is true for two data sets. And now if you add, this is also LBFGS, kind of a line uh, uh, as well. And if you add like the SAG uh, algorithm, then this is very similar to the plot, the wishful thinking plot I had showed uh, earlier. You get like a line in a semi-log plot, linear convergence, but the slope is better than the uh, Nesterov in brown and better than the cyclic algorithm in, in, uh, in, in white, in black. So in black, IAG, this is a usual cyclic algorithm, which is not really improving over gradient descent. Okay, so this is just an instance of uh, the speed up that you can see for optimization. Then, but it's non-uniform sampling, so if you start to take data which the, where the norms of your features vary a lot, then you see in this big plot that all methods do not do very well. Okay, so this is the type of thing that, uh, that you see. And with this simple like improvement, which dates back essentially to, uh, to Nesterov, by sampling functions according to the, what is called the Lipschitz constant, then you get something which is working much better. Okay, so this is a case where theory is suggesting some improvement and it does uh, show uh, in, uh, in practice. Okay, so this is, so there's a bit more to it. So it, there's additional tricks to make it like uh, really better, but the, the core idea is really looking at theoretical proofs and trying to optimize constants in, uh, in the proofs. All right, so after we uh, work on that, there was a series of papers by uh, several people working on similar techniques with uh, similar guarantees, okay, uh, many acronyms. I will really like, uh, like to mention like SVRG, like this stochastic variance reduced gradient, which came up with a very nice interpretation in terms of uh, variance reduction, okay? So the way I have justified the algorithm was based on laziness. So I'm, I'm just computing a single gradient and take all values for the other ones. But it turns out to lead to a difficult proof whereas this variance reduction uh, technique and this dates back from Johnson and Zeng and uh, Zeng and, colleague, and colleagues. This is really like a very, very important uh, interpretation. 
And this allows also to avoid uh, storage, okay? So if you want to know more, come to see me uh, after, the, after the talk. Also, like we mentioned, like non-convex extensions, okay? So, so I've, I've, presented, I've, I've presented only results in the strongly convex case, but this extends the convex case only. And once you have that, uh, people uh, in this room have uh, extended this to the non-convex problem where you, you do convert to a stationary pool. And the last uh, uh, technical slide is about acceleration. Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, the current like state of uh, the current like uh, convergence rates for gradient descent. All of this is linearly convergent, n kappa uh, for gradient descent, n square root kappa for acceleration. So this, those are batch algorithms. So you see the dependence in n. What we do and others do, you get n plus kappa. But you see that for some regimes of kappa, you may, do, you may do better with acceleration. And this was solved by a series of people. None of them uh, uh, has worked with us. Okay, so this is like other people's work. So first for SDCA by Sherry Schwartz and then by others uh, afterwards. Also very nice technique uh, by uh, Hong Zulin, who's probably uh, in this room, and trying a very simple way to accelerate all, all of these techniques. Whenever you have an algorithm that is doing well, use this technique called Catalyst, it will do even better, okay? So here, what I want to mention is that now this is optimal, okay? So, so I don't want to spend too much time describing how optimal it is, but this is if you want to optimize finite sum, then there is no way you can uh, uh, build that, uh, that, uh, that uh, complexity, and this is not achieved, okay? Now we have matching uh, upper and uh, lower bounds. All right, so to uh, summarize a bit uh, this last like uh, 20 minutes, what we have is we have some uh, exponentially convergent LGD, and I think there was a nice, uh, um, a nice uh, uh, interplay between theory and practice, and vice versa. Okay, so to summarize, this was the wishful thinking plot. Okay, the one I just uh, did uh, by myself. Okay, and and then you had like some experiments which uh, more or less confirm what we uh, what we hope to see from the analysis. Okay, so. Of course, it's not a perfect match, and we never claim that it's a perfect match, okay? It more or less looks the same, and you see the, the behavior that you predict from theory is uh, reasonably there in practice. And then, okay, there is also some uh, 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 improvements which are based on uh, analysis. So this, like, non-uniform sampling ID, I think to me really comes from the bounds, okay? So it's natural in retrospect, but uh, really, it's uh, to me an effect of, of, uh, of the bound. So it's a case where everything is really, is really uh, 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 working uh, quite well. So same thing for acceleration, okay? So this, we just reuse the analysis of Nesterov, and by combining this in a very correct way uh, with the algorithm, okay, uh, this leads to acceleration. So if you don't, like, make sure to combine it in a theoretically, like, a correct way, it doesn't work, okay? So you, there are many ways to combine acceleration with that algorithm, okay? that one, okay, but if you do it like directly, it does not work, okay, only after you combine this correctly, where the bound is correct, you get acceleration. So it's a case where uh, theory really uh, impacts, can impact practice for the convex case. Okay, so let me go back to this. All right, now we also have like matching upper and lower bound, so this is very nice, okay, we have a set of problems for which the basic thing you can do is something, and we achieve it. So this is, uh, I think, uh, very nice. And to me, a success of the community. Okay, so machine learning, of course, together with optimization and statistics, is found of those lower and upper bounds. And it's an example where uh, uh, 10 years ago, nothing was known, neither lower bounds nor upper bounds. And now, 10 years later, you have everything is matching. I think this is quite, uh, quite a success. All right, so this is not uh, limited uh, to uh, uh, stochastic gradient techniques. This is more or less true for all like uh, machine learning based on convex optimization. Okay, so here I've taken a, selec a selection of problems for, for which uh, similar things uh, do hold. This is by no means an exhaustive list, so it's big, etc. But uh, tomorrow I'll talk about like single pass AGD and the effect on test error. And this is a similar area where because we assume convexity, then we can get some nice uh, uh, analysis. A classical theme is to uh, play with least squares, but also with convex losses. So this is something which is like, easy to do uh, in that setup. You can go non-parametric using kernels, and there are experts in this room uh, as well. You can go discrete by using some modular optimization, 
And, uh, and there are also many other examples. Just here, I want to uh, highlight the fact that for all of those, there is a nice interplay between uh, uh, theory and practice, okay? So what is better in theory can be better in practice, and what is better in practice can often be uh, analyzed by theory. Okay, this is to me like the, what I like uh, about uh, machine learning is this kind, kind of interplay between theory and practice. But now, what about deep learning, okay? So this is like uh, uh, where this is, is going to be, uh, to, be, uh, to be a problem, okay? So for the last part of the talk, I will mostly mention like uh, the analysis that we can do for deep learning or the lack of analysis or essentially what will, uh, we will not be able to have all of that, okay? So we will have, we will have some analysis, but we have to weaken a bit uh, our demands and have something which is not as strong. For all of those techniques, okay, what this, those uh, theories can say, they will tell you, give me a problem, okay, with give me a few like, uh, like quantities on your problem, I will tell you how much time you, you need to run the algorithm. This will tell you how much sample I need to get good performance, okay? So we're very far away from that in that setup. And uh, so let's look at it. So I'm going to uh, consider uh, 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 a simplified problem compared to the whole area of deep learning, okay? So if you do deep learning for computer visions, this is like a baby model, okay? So this is like a fully connected, like a neural network. So here I've put like uh, two, hidden, two hidden components, but you can have more than that, of course. But just from the start, you see that even to talk about like generalization bounds, I have to limit the problem to something which is very far from what people use in, uh, in uh, for example, in computer vision. Okay, so first, a simplification. Okay, so here, uh, so just to, um, so there is some transpose hidden a bit everywhere here. So, you have, so the, the way it works, you start from X, you take a linear function, take some nonlinear functions taken component-wise and iterate, okay? So this is the uh, 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 classical deep learning thing. So why deep? Because you have like multiple layers. So here, there are two problems that people have uh, looked at. First, how well uh, should we generalize, okay? And how can we uh, optimize? So for the generalization guarantees, I really advise you to look at the very nice uh, talk by Sasha Racklin on the myth a uh, booster uh, thing with deep learning edition, where one of the myths uh, to be, uh, to be, uh, to be uh, thought is like, because I have many parameters, I cannot generalize. Okay, so we hear this a lot uh, when you look at people doing uh, deep learning. This is not, number of parameters is not what we care about for generalization guarantees. And there's very nice two papers by uh, Bartlett and Kothers and Golovich and co-authors uh, showing that uh, a nice performance guarantees, okay, for the, if you go from empirical risk to uh, uh, expected risk, okay? So the fact that those networks can generalize is, is not a surprise, okay? So it's saying that nothing is known about those models is a bit like an over, as an overstatement. Things are known and have nice references on that uh, on the board. Then the problem and what I want to focus on now is optimization. Okay, so as is well known, those problems are non-convex optimization problems. And now let's look at all the things that can go wrong if you go non-convex. Oh, in fact, now it's better than in my slides. Okay, so thank you. So, uh, all right, so what can go wrong when you uh, do like non-convex optimization? So this is a function in 2D, two variables. This is the values with colors, okay, from large in red and uh, to uh, small in, uh, in blue. Global optimum over there, okay? Local optima over there. Stationary point over there. Local maxima over there. Some kind of plateau over there. So anything can happen, okay? So if I take like a generic uh, non-convex uh, function, then any of those can happen. It can be in a bad local minimum. It can have be a stationary point. It can have long plateaus. I can have bad initialization. I can have overfitting. There are many things that can happen. And uh, uh, the question is, can we do something about it? Okay, so the first uh, thing is, Having strong guarantees for like generic non-convex optimization is uh, largely impossible, okay? So if you, if you want to have guarantees just based on smoothness, then there are known matching upper and lower bounds, which are exponential in dimension, okay? And it's quite uh, uh, hard to have anything uh, concrete for the generic problem, okay? So we need to use uh, uh, specifics of the problem. So we are trying to minimize the deep, like the error by the training risk of a deep uh, neural network. So this has been studied a lot, and I will mention two, uh, two, uh, two papers. There are many more than that, so 
If you feel offended not to be part in that slide, just come, send me an email, I will gladly uh, add you. So there have been two sets of work. The first one is suggesting that maybe stationary points are the problem, okay? So if I can have an algorithm that will escape stationary points, so meaning that if I run gradient descent or stochastic version thereof, I only know I'm going to convert to a stationary point where the gradient is zero, okay? So I can convert to a point over there where the gradient is zero. But some analysis does suggest that, okay, maybe this is the only problem. If I can escape those stationary points, then I'm, I'm fine, okay? So I don't think that this is uh, really uh, uh, applicable to, uh, uh, to uh, deep learning. Uh, the, typically, those papers tend to make very strong assumptions about the model, okay? So too much, uh, too much randomness, and the link with what we've seen in practice is, uh, is not seen. Then you, can, you may say oh, the problem is really that uh, maybe I have only a good local maximum, okay? This will mean that whenever I start, okay, I end up in a local maximum, but if they are all good, okay, then that's fine. And there is like nice work by uh, Solta Nol Kotabi on uh, proving this, but again, this is on a weaker version of deep neural networks. So often this is, I think, with specific types of activations, okay? And this does not extend to the general case, okay? So, by no means, I try to say that those papers are not interesting. They just provide some insights, but they don't like really uh, stick to uh, what we want to do, which is try to prove some convergence for uh, uh, those deep neural networks. All right, so let's uh, look at it. Let's look at what we can do. So I'm going to oversimplify even more. I'm going to consider a single uh, hidden layer. Okay, so uh, this is a single hidden layer, and the key. Uh, the key insight is to see it as an average of predictors. Okay, so if I take so theta two is a vector, okay? So if I expand this like uh, neural network into, this is like each of the uh, neurons, uh, each, this is all, all of the uh, hidden neurons, okay? I can see uh, my prediction as a sum of the hidden neurons uh, prediction. So I have a family of functions, which is an average of uh, predictors, each of them phi of wi, uh, which has the same form. Okay, so it's just like pattern matching between uh, uh, this and that. And here I'm going to minimize a very simple like, uh, a problem, which is minimizing the risk. So you can see this as any expectation, either over the training set or the testing set. I'm going to assume the loss is convex, which is kind of uh, reasonable. I'm doing like least squares of logistic. So the loss is convex with respect to H, okay? Of course not with respect to W. All right, so the main insight we're going to use is not, uh, it's not ours. This is just realizing that if we want to look at what we call over parameterized model, okay? So this is where there is a leap of like, uh, maybe a leap of faith or a leap of whatever you want, but I'm trying to go from, oh, let's take M large. So if M is large, I have a lot of neurons. It's a bit like I'm optimizing over a measure, okay? So here you see the uh, uh, fuzziness, a bit of the argument, but we're going to uh, make it following like previous work. So we're going to assume that our average of, uh, predictors can be seen as an expectation over some measure, and there's a perfect match if that measure is uh, the empirical distribution associated with my uh, WIs. So this is just a pure rewriting. Okay, so this is like things which are uh, classical. And now what I have is I've now, now I think I have a problem on measures. Okay, so my loss is convex. Okay, this is linear in my measure. So you may say I'm done. Okay, I'm doing convex optimization on measures. But there are a few things which are not, uh, not done yet. The first thing is that those measures are, in the, uh, are infinite dimensional objects, so it's not going to be easy to manipulate. And this is why Frank Wolf techniques uh, are for. So if you know what this means, uh, this should ring a bell. If you don't, it's not the topic of the talk. But essentially, this is a way to uh, learn over like convex hull of potentially like many uh, extreme points by adding like uh, extreme points one after the other. Okay, so this is like used a lot. We should do like sparsity related uh, algorithms. But here, uh, what you can show, this is non-structurable. Okay, the task of adding a neuron, okay, is typically uh, NP hard. And anyway, this is all that people use in practice. In practice, nobody uh, really uh, is adding neurons one at a time. Okay, they all do HGD uh, directly. Okay, so this is all nice and interesting. This is not uh, sticking to what people do in practice. Then we're going to follow what people use in practice, which is we have a finite, we have a measure, which is a, a, with a finite set of what we call particles. And uh, we're going uh, to consider the algorithm that people take in practice, which is uh, back propagation, which is just gradient descent on my, on W, okay? 
what uh, people do in practice when they, when they fit those models is not descent, gradient descent on mu, okay, with the uh, Euclidean geometry on mu, but with, uh, they do uh, gradient descent on those Ws. Okay, so there are two questions. Where does this converge to when the number of particles go to infinity? So this is the idea of uh, if I have an over-parameterized over model, I have lots of particles, can I say something about that? Okay, so th th does it tend to something uh, good? And if that number of particles is big enough, will I get the correct optimizer? Okay, so global minimum of this, okay? So the best measure. So we're going to look at that. So the first answer will be, indeed, uh, so this is a nice paper by Nitanda and uh, Suzuki showing that this converts to a Wasserstein gradient flow. So essentially a gradient, a gradient uh, descent with respect to the geometry of uh, the Wasserstein distance. So are we not uh, going to spend too much time on that? And what I want to focus on is that the result that we had uh, with uh, my postdoc, Lenaik uh, Shiza, trying to show that this does converge with the optimal measure. Okay, so I'm doing gradient descent on something which is like, it not convex. There are even many stationary points, but if you initialize correctly, this is going to converge if the number of particles tends to infinity uh, to the correct measure. So here, again, think about the weakness of what we say. Okay, we say if we have sufficiently many particles, we don't say how many, then this is going to converge. All right, so the, let's uh, look at it. So this is uh, the general framework, in fact. This like, abstracts away a bit from uh, neural networks. I, have, I want to optimize over a measure. I'm going to parameterize it as a, an average of, uh, of, uh, of particles or neurons. And uh, so typically, uh, we did a gradient descent. The classical way of like, analyzing it is to use, a, to use a gradient flow. So I'm going to replace the gradient step by the continuous limit where the step size goes to zero, and I get this uh, nice differentiable equation, a differential equation, the idea being that this will encode both gradient descent and SGD. Okay, so both those two algorithms can be seen as uh, a various discretization of, of that uh, same gradient flow. All right, so another, uh, what, okay, the, many people showed is that if you take M to go to infinity, the limit has a well, uh, well, uh, uh, formulated description, which is the Wasserstein gradient flow. I will not describe it. It's just to show that there is a limiting behavior, okay? And this can be, be, this can be formalized uh, uh, quite uh, 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 precisely. Now the question is global convergence, so let's look at that. And we will need two ingredients. We will need like homogeneity of, the, of uh, somewhere and a bit of uh, a good initialization. So what do I mean by homogeneity? And this has, this has been used by other people uh, before is that I need some homogeneity in my uh, function phi of W, okay? So if you think about uh, neural networks, there is a bit of homogeneity. On, for example, with respect to the output layer, so this is the output layer, and if you do like rectify linear units, when sigma is a homo homogeneous function, you get like full homogeneity of the function with respect to theta, theta two and theta one. Okay, so here we can leverage some properties of our uh, function phi of W. And then if you initialize, initialize with a measure with sufficient support, okay, so you have to imagine that we have to initialize the density for theta two and theta one, then we're going to uh, get this global convergence. So here, as you can see, very different from uh, the previous part of the talk. I'm not giving any details, okay? I'm just saying that, oh, if you initialize big enough, then it's going to, uh, it's going to, uh, to work well, okay? So of course, everything is very well precise in the paper, but this is uh, much more complicated, and the type of math it requires is very different. Okay, I'm not going to uh, be very quantitative, and I think this is, well, the problem is what we currently have, is that this is all qualitative. If the number of particles goes to infinity, and if you initialize well enough, okay, then it's this is going to, uh, uh, to work. So let's look, if you can a bit predict what you would see in practice, so this is like a very, large scale deep learning problem. So you see dimension two, okay? And I'm just considering like the uh, input layers. I'm assuming the output layer is a, a constant. And the generating network is simply with five neurons, okay? And uh, uh, I'm fitting with uh, least squares. And here I'm, I'm representing the neurons, okay? Since, since I'm using really units, only the direction matters because I have homogeneity. And essentially what I want is that those neurons, those particles, they need to converge to the lines uh, in, uh, in dotted, which are the lines which are generating the data. So if I, we know that five neurons were used to generate the data, so the global optimum of the loss should be perfect, but if you launch with five neurons, it's not really uh, converging, whereas if you uh, 
uh, take a lot of neurons. This is it's essentially what we show. If you take the, the continuous limit, then it should converge, and all of them end up converging to the, uh, to the proper neurons. And if you take 10 neurons, it's a bit in between, then it, it also works. And I have a video. And so the video is like the gradient flow working. And uh, so I'm showing it once, okay? So I want you to, to focus on the funky neurons, this one and, and this one, okay, again. Right, so this is, those are trajectories which are not typically, not typical of like optimization of our convex function, okay? They, they do like uh, vary a lot, okay? And so here what we show essentially, so to be very precise, is that if the number of neurons go to infinity, there's no quantification at the moment, then they will all converge to the correct neurons, okay? Then we did some experiments. Uh, with a bit, more, a bit more data, okay, with 100, uh, 100 like uh, dimensions. Again, we generated data from uh, neural networks with like M0, uh, M0 neurons, and M0 was, I forgot, okay, something like 20. And, and then what we do here, and also very important, with, with all those like qualitative results, you're always on the verge of triviality, okay? So we, you have to be very careful that you're not making a trivial statement. Why? Because if I start to uh, allowing myself to generate uh, like a population of neurons, then I have neurons everywhere, okay? So if I go to my previous slide, I can start with neurons everywhere, okay? And I have like all directions which are already, uh, which are already there, okay? So up to sm some sm small errors, I can sample many, many neurons and I can cover all, all potential neurons, including the ones which are uh, the optimal ones, okay? So this is uh, what we try to do in this simulation. This is what we do here. This is we, we generate neurons and we fix the directions and we really optimize their weight. Okay, this will be the trivial uh, thing that, that, that will converge, but this will converge with uh, exponential dependence on dimension because I need to hit the neuron exactly. And this is unlikely if I have a finite number of neurons. Whereas in blue, this is uh, our particle gradient flow. So that dotted line, this is uh, M0, showing that uh, we know that after that, we are able to convert to, to, we are able to convert to the global optimum. And we, what we show is that, okay, there's supposed to be some color over there, okay, okay, green. And, uh, and uh, so this is just like, uh, just noise. And what we, what we show is that the curve in blue has to go to zero or minus infinity because this is a semi-log plot, a log, 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 log plot when n goes to infinity. What we see in practice here, this is a very like basic toy model that it does do better, much uh, uh, quicker than infinity. And this is essentially what's missing at the moment is a lack of quantification. All right, so let me uh, now try to answer the question after I presenting those two, uh, those two, uh, those two uh, uh, set of works. So the first set of work, everything was nice. Theory was matching practice, okay, with very strong guarantees. In the second, the second set of works, at the moment it is very weak, okay, I'm not satisfied, okay, and the question is, is it possible to have the best of both worlds, uh, have strong guarantees for uh, deep learning? Okay, so I think here, this is my own like desires uh, when I do machine learning, is trying to have this nice match between uh, three in practice. Okay, this is not necessarily what you, you all want, but really this is something which uh, I try to achieve in, uh, in, in the work we are doing. So both like, empirical performance has to match a bit guarantees. And if you have a good theory, it should impact practice, okay? In the context of, like, for example, like optimization, non-uniform sampling, there was an impact of theory, maybe not huge, but this is like an important practice. Now, I have to answer yes or no, okay? So uh, depending on the mood, whether you like French movies or American movies, you may have like a happy ending or a non-happy ending. So, uh, uh, <laughs> So I could like talk about like uh, all the reasons why learning is doomed and we would all end up in Google or Facebook, but I want to end up in a positive note, okay? And uh, in particular, given the announcement of yesterday, uh, like one billion for like uh, computing uh, in MIT, I think we should all be uh, positive. I won't get money out of it, but you should be positive at least. <laughs> in that, I think at the end, uh, I see this more as an opportunity in the sense that what we currently do is not satisfactory, and we, I include people doing uh, uh, theory, we are far away from what people can achieve, uh, uh, I think, in practice. And to me, one of the reasons is that 
the tools that we need, that we use, are simply not adapted, okay? So we relied a lot on like finite complexity bounds, and at the moment this is, to me, I don't see any path to, uh, to success uh, for that. And hopefully the goal really is this is trying to go from this super qualitative results, okay? So the last set of, of uh, slides were really like showing that when M is large, like a lot of particles, a lot of neurons, we do achieve what we want. But this is still very, very far away from what we'd like to achieve. And hopefully, when I come back like in, uh, in uh, five years, I have the same set of slides for the uh, second part. Thank you for your attention. in space, sending a dog in space, sending people in space. There's also some things which is I should, I could also fit a suit and, you know, make sure that I can actually walk in gravity. Clearly, there's one path that's really getting me there, and the other one that's sort of, like, sort of distracting. My question is, is studying shallow networks a distraction from actually understanding how those deep networks actually do? That's a very good point. So should we, should we add, like, layers one by one or go straight to the deep one? I don't know. I think that's a, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, I still believe that, yeah, I think the depth is, I see depth as an extra complicating factor and not as a way to make things more simple, but this is my own opinion based on like intuition, but I'm sure many people may disagree in the room that deep is necessary, okay? And I don't know, I think this is a, the, this is the, the, key, the key issue. In fact, all analysis are all uh, studying like one middle layer to two, and, and but I see Souvrit like uh, moving like this. Maybe Souvrit has a different opinion, but. Uh. <laughs> it, it depends. I was actually about to ask that in your analysis, you have yeah. the same uh, what is the key challenge that arises if I go from one to two? From, one, from zero to one or one to two? Yeah. If you add one more layer. Well, then you, you, the algebra works a kind of a bit because you preserve homogeneity, but the problem is that this, this is not true. Uh, that statement over there, this is not true if you have more, if you have more than uh, one layer. Okay, so you gain that separability in terms of neurons is not true because if, if you have several layers, and if you do this at the output layers, then uh, you lose the sharing of parameters at the inner layers. And so whole, everything is gone. So what people do often is to do this, is to assume that uh, you have like uh, several copies of the same networks and you optimize about those copies, but this is not what you want. Okay, so this is like, to me this is an oversimplification. So this, for example, will not extend to the, the deep case. What this will do is that like, locally, so we have some arguments saying that locally it might uh, explain what locally uh, around one layer it is doing something interesting, but this is even weaker than what we have right now. More questions? I actually have a comment, a oh. question oh. also there. But relating to the deep thing, because there is like some kind of uh, circuit complexity theory type of stuff that as you add that for a certain class of functions, your approximation power uh, has exponentially better dependence on dimensionality of things. Sure, sure, but such types of things as. But yeah, but really, uh, this precisely is the problem. Yeah. Really, it's not, but, but this is still in the science fiction setting of yeah. being away from what. But I think there are, there are tons of arguments existing that use this piece of mass, use this piece of mass, but making the connection precisely is often lacking. So I hear I'm trying to fight against hand waving. Okay, so I'm doing some hand waving at the moment because what we have is not super strong. But I think we should keep our like requirements. This is demanding to have those guarantees all the time. But I think we should not like simply like give up and try to achieve the same ones. But I don't believe this is going to be by using the current tools that we have at the moment. One more question. Yeah. <laughs> Barrier to getting a rate of convergence here. Oh, I think none. I think it's just, I think, uh, 
if you look at those other papers doing it, there's a very nice paper by, by the group of uh, Andrea Montanari, this one, who's doing something of a, of a, a similar kind, but with HGD, and they do have like uh, things which can be quantified. So you see on the subset of problems, but there should be a way. So if you assume, for example, that uh, you put some uh, randomness into the problem, so if I'm assuming you, you generate the so generating network is uh, obtained by uh, some number of neurons, then you should be able to get some, uh, some guarantees. Uh, this is what we're currently doing. But again, this will be for the non-deep network. And if you want to go to the moon, maybe we need to do something else. But, uh, <laughs> but for the moon, they tried to go first to the like, uh, very high in the sky, and then it was yeah, done. They were going to, there, right? They were not trying to suit. I mean, like, oh. you know, when I wrote the right, the right stuff? Oh no, what, there's a movie about that. Okay, so. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, thank Francis again. <laughs>